Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? So glad to see you. So glad you're here. We've got two or three announcements this morning. Um, this Wednesday, believe it or not, is Ash Wednesday. So at 6.30 this Wednesday night, we'll have our Ash Wednesday service. <clears throat> um, you know, we usually have Acts 2.42 on Wednesday nights, and we usually have a dinner and all that, so we, we won't be having Acts 2.42. We will only have the Ash Wednesday service at 6.30. There's one correction in the bulletin. Now, you know who does the bulletin. Kathleen types it all up, but Betty Newman and Randy and everybody and Aaron, and it has Aaron's address down as having the high school kids tonight, but Betty Newman's having the high school kids tonight. You would think that Aaron and Betty would have figured that out. <laughs> You'd think. Anyway, so if you're a high schooler, we'll be having... Um, We'll be having the kids at our house. Terry and I will be having them at our house tonight, 6 o'clock. And there's lots of good food, so, uh, you have, but you have to be in high school, so don't, don't be showing up. Um, one, one on a serious note, um, we haven't gotten an email out about this because we wanted to make sure we had the right times and everything, but as you know, one of our beloved members, Tom Parker, passed away um, a couple of weeks ago, and his funeral is going to be March 4th at 11 o'clock. Mary's going to need some little finger foods for the family and, and for reception afterwards. But um, some of his friends wanted me to make sure you knew about that on March 4th. We'll be getting more out in an email this week. I am so glad to see you this morning. I was gone last week. Terry and I, y'all remember about a year ago, I was announcing that we had a new little grandbaby, Lucy, and we went to her first birthday party last weekend. So how can she be one years old, right? But anyway, we're so glad to be back and so glad to see you this morning. So um, if you'll bow with me, we'll get ready to start our worship service. God, we just thank you so much this morning that we can gather together and we can um, be here to worship you. Lord, we just ask that nothing separate us from you today. Teach us how to use, um, how to choose only you today, how to get closer to you today, how we can walk by your word, and how we can keep our hearts pure and undivided. Um, protect us from any careless thoughts or actions or words that we might say, and uh, keep us from being distracted by other things that all of our focus is on you. God, we love you so much, and we're so grateful for Jesus Christ and his redeeming love and salvation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm going to announce the, uh, the song that we're singing this morning. Uh, it's written by Dennis Jernigan. Um, easy to say this morning. Um, it was written back in 1988. And uh, Dennis, the story behind this song is that Dennis was going through some very, very difficult times. And it was uh, a time of his life that a lot of his faith was being challenged, but also um, his thoughts and some of his uh, temptations were being challenged as well. And he came to know Christ and he totally changed his life in 1981. Uh, but um, the, the, the song itself has a lot of meaning to me. I heard it first time at uh, First Woodway in, ba in, uh, in Waco. And we sang it there as a congregation and a choir. And so um, the, the purpose and the reason behind this, 
the song is freedom and love is possible no matter what sin or addictions you may have, may be suffering. So I hope you listen to the words and I hope it, uh, it touches your heart just as much as it's touched ours. And we thank Bob for bringing it to our attention and that's why we're singing. <laughs> I invite you all now, if you would, let's stand and let's sing together, join our voices together in praise as we sing, shout to the Lord. Oh, there. 
if you would remain standing, let's continue to sing. We have come this morning to join in worship.
join me in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, loving you, praising you, worshiping you, Lord, for you are our King. You are our God, Lord, and we love you. We thank you for the many, many blessings that you've bestowed upon us individually and as a corporate church, Lord, and in our community, Lord. We recognize the blessings that we have, Lord, but we also have needs that we lay before your feet today, Lord. We have members of our family and our friends that are hurting, Lord, emotionally, physically, Lord. We ask that you heal their pain, that you wrap your arms of comfort around them, Lord. We have those that are grieving grieving for family or friends or other losses, Lord. We ask that you give them a peace, a peace that passes all understanding, Lord, that they will know your love and your comfort, Lord. As we move into this season of, of Easter, Lord, and the realities of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus' life on this earth, Lord, and and God's love for us through that sacrifice, Lord, we ask that you give us a burden for our community, for, for their physical needs, for their mental needs, Lord, but for their spiritual needs, Lord, that only you, only you can provide, Lord. We ask that you make us the hands and feet of our community, that we can be Christ's love in each and every action that we take. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We lay these before you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in just a moment, you're going to hear the introduction for this song, and you're going to think, we just sang that song, but we didn't. It's the same tune of the hymn we just sang a moment ago, but it's a different key and different text. And we don't normally do that, but we are today because the text applies so closely to what Randy's going to preach about later on that I wanted to include both of them. So this song we're going to sing is called God the Father of Your People, You Have Called Us to Be One. If you would, join us together in singing. Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity, my wife and I, Erin, to lead our students to their first ever weekend retreat. And it was an amazing weekend. Uh, God did some really, really cool things in the lives of our students. We went up to Mount Lebanon, up in Cedar Hill. We took six students with us and just had an amazing weekend. And I wanted you to hear about some of that from our students. So I'm going to invite Keegan Nadal to come on up and Shannon Hughes, if you would come on up. These are two of our middle school students. And they're going to share just briefly about 
what God taught them during the weekend, and then maybe a fun story as well that they took away. So if you would make welcome this morning, might be a little bit nervous, so give them a round of applause. Keegan <laughs> Nadal and Shannon Hughes. Today, um, I'll be talking about what I took away from it. Um, today, what I learned is that we should give special thanks to God. He helps our destiny, God's words, our power. He shows us authority, and Jesus is the Lord with us. He just helps us stay through all the bad, all the struggling you go through. If you just turn to him, he can help you get through that, and he can enlighten you and register and you can like re-show you the way of the light if you just take a moment and listen to him. God hates all the fake things that people do. He hates it if you go to church and you act like you love him, but as soon as you leave, you just completely forget about him. He hates all the fake. He hates all the people who say they love him or they love you and they really don't. He just hates it all. And God... This is God's universe. We belong to him. We are God. God's like, he is our change. God made everything for us, and we belong to him that way. He made you. He made me, your friends, family. He made it all. So give God your name and also never believe in one day of a bad day and just focus on what you can do with, for God. What I found fun when we were there is that... Uh, I met new people around the same age, and they all had their different views on life, and it's just, it was nice to see how people interacted with each other differently than what normal people would, and that's, <laughs> what, that's what I, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm not as organized as him, I didn't write a speech, so. Um, what I really took away was that it doesn't matter how much or how much sin you do or other people do, you can forgive, they can forgive you no matter what. And it, like, it doesn't matter what other people think of God, it doesn't matter what other people think of you, but it's always what matters between you and him. It's, it's just the connection between um, us to us and God. So it doesn't matter if we have so many distractions like technology or sports or school so that takes us away from uh, spending time with him. But what we need to realize is that he's our number one. And he, it doesn't matter if you go to a friend's house, pray, talk to him. Just spill out everything that you have to say to him and to him only. And what I thought really hit was he's a God of peace and calmness. You go to him, you're going to have peace. You pray to him, you're going you're gonna to be calm. And it, um, he doesn't like whenever people do something to cover up who you really are. So if you're trying to get likes on a social media post, he wants you to be who you are. It doesn't matter how many likes you get or whatever. It's all about what he thinks of you, and that is literally all you need in life. And um, what I think is misplaced identity can keep you from giving God yourself. If you let your friends get in the way of him, you're not going to have a good relationship. What I thought was really fun over the weekend uh, that we went was kind of what Keegan said. It was really fun meeting new people, getting to worship him, and the music was awesome. Like, it really hit. It really hit well. That's all I got to say. <laughs> wonderful to hear from those kids, is it not? God is with them, and we just 
we're just so happy that, that they are where they are and growing in Christ. Uh, I will hope you will join me this morning in reading uh, our scripture. It's 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Please stand. You already have. Okay. <laughs> You're ahead of me this morning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Karen. Um, if that scripture looks familiar, then you've been here a couple of weeks. Um, if you've noticed, we have added a verse or two each week. The challenge that I have um, put before you is uh, try to memorize the first chapter of 1 John. Quite an undertaking. Um, if you're like, Pastor, I can't do that. Well, let me encourage you to, to memorize one verse. <laughs> or four verses, but to take the opportunity maybe daily to, to read 1 John um, 1, and even, even in your bulletin, we encourage you to take your bulletins home to be able to uh, be mindful of that, but just to, every day to allow the Word of God to, to touch you and to speak with you and, and to you in, in a very powerful way. Um, it's a very re rewarding spiritual discipline, and I do want to encourage you not to make it a matter of consternation, but to make it a matter of joy as you are able to, to dig into God's word. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't be that guy? <laughs> One of the joys of, of leading and, and mentoring others and kind of giving those mentoring moments is you have opportunities at times to, to be able to, to say those words. Don't, don't be that guy. Maybe, maybe you're in Dallas and you're driving on the expressway and and you have your, your son or daughter, granddaughter, whoever it may be, sitting next to you, and you see somebody weaving in and out of the traffic, and you use that as a point of lesson, of, and you turn, you say, don't be th that guy. <laughs> or maybe you're on the golf course, and you, you see somebody drive their golf cart a little too close to the green, and you turn to your playing partner, and you say, don't be that guy. Or, or, or maybe you're at a dinner and, and you, you leave the dinner and, and somebody had, had been talking just incessantly and, and you, you, you turn to your partner and you say, when, when we go, let's, let's be sure not to be like that guy. <laughs> we can see that over and over and we, we, we take those words and we, we embrace those and we, as mentors and, and teachers of others, we have moments that we can say, be like this person, this is a great example but also, we have the opportunity to say, don't be like this person. <laughs> As you know, throughout the last few weeks, we've been looking at the book of 1 John. John, the beginning of the letter, as we just read, with the majesty and the joy of hearing and, and seeing and, and touching the word of life, Jesus himself. You have the apostle John, who um, at this point in his life is an older man, much like a mentor to others, to those that he writes and those that he is in contact with. He speaks to the, to the churches and he speaks of each individual. In chapter 3, we see that he emphasizes God's lavishing love and the love that we have from the Father, the Father that gives us the, the joy that we have. 
but he also reminds us that, that the walk that we have is not only a, a vertical walk in our relationship with Christ, but also a, a horizontal walk that we, we are to, to live with one another. Um, in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 3, he gives us a warning not to be led astray, not to live and act as the rest of the world who do not know God, who do not live in the light. In today's passage, we, we come to chapter 3, verse 11. And not only are we to love a God who has lavished his love for us, but in the passage, in a very, very critical way, he doesn't use these words, but he does, in fact, say, don't be like that guy. So I invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 3 as we begin looking in verse 11. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. He begins in a very uh, similar way that he said before as he speaks about the beginning. He says in verse 11, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. So again, John is giving that, that premise, that principle that we are to love God, but also that we are called to love another. But then he gets to a, a point where it may surprise the readers, it may surprise you as you read. He says, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So I have two points this morning. The, the first is this. Beware, our actions can be murderous. <laughs> when John wrote this letter and he, he mentioned the words of Cain, surely the, the readers of the day, their, their ears perked up, their eyes widened because they knew the story of Cain. They knew of the story of one who, who lost it and, 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 and killed his own brother. Now, most of us know the story, but if you don't, let's, let's take a quick review and encourage you to keep your, your finger there in, in 1 John and go over to um, uh, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4, and if you remember Genesis 4, it's at the beginning, uh, creation has been made, uh, Adam and Eve have been, 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 been created, have been formed, and, in, and there is the opportunity in 4.1 that Eve says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now just kind of imagine that, ladies in particular, that they've never had a child before. <laughs> it's not like they've seen children running around and, and they know what, what children are. But Eve, in, in her... In her joy, she says, I, with the Lord's help, I, I have brought forth a man. <laughs> and this man that she speaks of, this little boy, his name is, is, is Cain. Now, now, later, she has another child named Abel. Now, we don't know the ages in this particular passage as it continues, but there's a point where the two boys, probably young men, brought a sacrifice to the Lord. So if you have your, your Bible again, Genesis 4, beginning in verse 2. Now Abel, again the younger, kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor, favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Let us pause for a moment. We don't know exactly why the offering of Cain was rejected. It, some have said because it was simply an afterthought. He's kind of threw out some extras that he didn't really need as opposed to, 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 Cain, to Abel, who gave the choice. It could have been a, an act of motive. We don't know for sure what was going on and why the offering was rejected, but we do know that it was. And so Cain became, became downcast. And so the Lord speaks to him 
in, in chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 11. But let me just say, too, that be, before the Lord has spoke, we, we, we are, are mindful that the fact that, that there is the excuses that certainly Cain could have made. Abel's sacrifice was with favor, Cain was not. And so beginning in verse 6, we, we continue, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Keep that phrase resonating in your mind that, that sin is crouching at your door. It's a very visual picture, one that we can identify of, of something or, or someone that, that may be around the corner that, that is going to, to jump out. One that is crouching at the door, ready to pounce. Now, Cain had every reason to have an excuse for thinking about any kind of sin. He can look to his own parents of Adam and Eve, and Adam who, who blamed Eve, Eve who blamed the serpent. He can look at Abel and say, if it wasn't for this younger brother of mine, my life would be pretty, pretty decent. <laughs> but he makes me look bad. He could have even looked to God himself and said, God, I'm angry with you and for what you've done and for you rejecting me. But God says to him, be careful, sin is ready to pounce. And then the tragedy we see in verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So here we have the story, the tragic story in the very early pages of God's word of the first man, the, the first child, the, the blessed child that was born that he, he kills his own brother. He kills the one that seemed to be the righteous one, seemed to know what the, the direction of his life. We, we know the story of Cain and Abel. And, and we even have an expression that we use of raising Cain. <laughs> it's an American phrase that it goes back to the word raising as a transitive verb to raise that's been used since the 14th century in England to mean to conjure up. It usually means to refer to somebody causing trouble as if it's, it's raising the spirit of Cain. It's raising that. He's becoming rowdy in that way. The original readers would have acted just like us. John, say, uh, John says, be careful in your anger because the anger could become like raising Cain. The anger could become even murderous. <laughs> I, again, we're talking to people like you and, and, and me in the choir. Yeah, the choir. Respectable people. Respectable. We, 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 we live our lives. We, we, we raise our families. We, we pay our taxes. We... Um, we, we are kind to each other and, and loving. And, and so how, how does this word that was given to the first century here, as we continue through 1 John, how does this word of not becoming murderous apply to respectable people in White Bluff, Hill County, and Bosque County? Why would the pastor even mention this? As we sit here in our comfortable place with our respectable family and friends, let us not be deceived to discount the possibility of anger turning to murder. Our penitentiaries are full of people that have been evil. And you would look at them and say, this is exactly where they belong. But let me tell you this. There are, there are people be behind bars that are people just like you and me. There are people that one day something snapped 
one day couldn't take it anymore and it snapped. And because of that, they find themselves in a place they never thought they would be. I, was, I found out this week that there is actually a, a, a television documentary. Um, it's called Snapped. Anybody ever hear of that? Yeah, it's in the Oxygen Network, wherever that is. And it's been around since 2004. But each episode examines a different felon who has committed murder or attempted murder. And the victim is usually the perpetrator's partner. It's so popular, it's inspired two spinoffs called Snapped, Killer Couples, and Snapped, uh, She Made Me Do It. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, just, I'm just stating the facts here. Now, let, let's, let's say this. Though we have the potential, we would think that whether we're here or, or, or watching online, that we would, would never come to the point where we find ourselves to be murderous. Um, but the danger is, beware, there is a possibility. <laughs> and, and as the saying goes, except for the grace of God, there go I. That we need to be aware that the worst of the worst could happen. We may not snap, but we may crackle and pop. <laughs> we, we may not totally lose it, but there could be some, some, some things that are less intensive that can be harmful. So, beware. Your anger could be murderous. But also, there's a warning that our, our, our actions can be harmful. Actions that, as Keegan said a moment ago, that normal people do, that, that us Christian people should never find ourselves doing. You see, the words that come out of our mouth may be harmful. They may not physically cut, but words can spiritually, emotionally, mentally cut. Now, another passage you may want to look at or, or jot down, you can look at later, is Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 29 and following, Paul says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every forms of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, as Christ God has forgiven. Now, there are many scriptures that we could look at. We could go throughout the, the rest of the morning and through the afternoon, looking at various scriptures that speak of the importance of watching what you say. But I think particularly here in Ephesians, he says, that which grieves the Holy Spirit, grieves the Holy Spirit, that that the words that are said not only may, may offend others or, or may, may hurt others, but, but even to the heavens itself, that, that the, the Holy Spirit is grieved. You may not be confident that you would never commit murder, but Jesus in Matthew 5 says that, that, um, that murder is sin, but thinking of murder and the angriest, angry that we may have is sinning as well. Most likely the anger that we have is manageable, but that never boils over. But it can simmer and simmer for a long time. You see, anger can just, just well up in us, can it? And it affects us. It changes us. It, it, it makes us say things and, and do things that that we may not even imagine saying. So what do we do with that anger? Anger towards others, anger towards a situation, even our anger towards God. What do we do with that anger? Let me suggest a few things. First, be honest with your relationship with God. John, back in 1 John, has given a contrast between the light of God 
and the darkness of the world. And the very core is, is for us to come and, and to ask ourselves, have, have, do, I, do I have the gift of, of, of faith? And, and, and if I accepted Christ as my Savior and Lord, have I, have I come to him with that, that reminder that the only hope that I have is through Jesus Christ? If I come to that point in my life where, where I, have, I have grasped that and, and God truly is the God of my life, you see, we can talk around the church and talk around good things and the light and, and be good people, but if I ever come to the point where I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior and I've accepted Christ, that he is the light of my world. Have we given ourselves over to God for deliverance and salvation? You see, we can't improve ourselves and make ourselves better. We can only do so through the grace that God has given us. The second is to recognize our anger. See it for what it is. It's dangerous. No matter how justified it may, it can turn to sin. It's a sin that crouches at our door ready to attack. A sin that is one that can overtake us. Third, commit the anger to prayer. Seek the Lord and turn your thoughts over to him. This relationship that I have I identify, and, and Lord, I, I pray towards this. And then, and then fourthly, to, to search the scriptures, look to the light of God's word. Look to where God speaks of the, the words that we say. And then the fifth thing I'd recommend is stay connected to your spiritual community. St stay connected to the church to, to encourage one another, to guide one another as we go through life's difficulties and, and, and trials. Now, let me do say this that treating anger in this way is not common. It's amazing that we as believers take some of the same responses and tactics that the rest of the world does. We, we seek revenge, we lash out, we, we, we do some things in very ungodly ways. Our response to life's difficulties not only reveals our love for the Lord, but also our love for others. It's a reminder, too, to be careful because the world is watching. John is saying that there is a difference in the way that we should handle disputes. It's certainly true within your families. As you, you go through uh, trials and, and, and troubles with family, perhaps, and you go through some difficulties to be able to come back and to say, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling in this area, but Lord, Lord I want to give this to you. It's true for our community to, to continue to love one another and, and to encourage one another. It, it's true for our church that if there's a dispute or, a, or an issue or something that doesn't seem to quite fit right, to be able to have conversation, to be able to talk with people personally, not merely to talk about people, but to speak and to pray and to have a, a Lord, guide me in this conversation because I want to glorify you. Because you are the light of the world. Do we have peace in our lives? Or do, do we want to sow discord? I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of anger out there. <laughs> I mean, you turn on the news, you maybe talk to your neighbors or whatever it may be. People just seem to be angry about things. So as a body of believers... How do we treat that? Do we come before the Lord and say, Lord, guide me in the midst of any anger that may be in my life. Lord, I give this fully to you. Our conversations that we have are powerful. Are we turning up the light of God's love or are we casting a shadow? In, in the spiritual realm, that reminder that there is more at work than we realize. And there's also more at stake. You see, we, 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 we come to church and we, we speak with people and we don't just talk about things that make our life better, but we're talking on a spiritual level. That God touches us in a spiritual way and one that as we speak with others that it, it deals with the, the, the topic of, of his salvation and, and eternity. <laughs> We're talking about eternal things. And the conversations we have here and now within our church and neighborhood and family 
can, can influence and impact a person not only of this life, but for all eternity. John is saying as he raises up this picture of Cain, he says, don't be that guy. <laughs> don't be that gal. Don't be that person. Be aware that anger can raise Cain and sin may be crouching at our door, ready to pounce if it hasn't already. Let us, believe, as believers, look deep within our hearts. Let us be repentant. Let us follow scriptural principles of praying for others, encouraging others, looking at the situation with godly eyes and open communication, speaking with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Back to 1 John 3, 16. You know what John 3.16 says. 1 John 3.16 is, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What kind of love is this? It's a sacrificial love. You see, what Cain needed to hear and what Cain should have done is to repent before the Lord for the anger that was beginning to well inside of him. Go to his brother Abel. Instead of being angry for his faithfulness, bring him praise and encouragement and learn from him and treat him as a brother. One that should be treated as a family member. For us today, let us listen and learn. Reject the temptation to raise Cain, a pattern that can lead to death. Rather, look to Christ one who gives us life today and for all eternity. I invite you to bow your heads together as we have a time of reflection. Thanks for letting me share just a few words from uh, 1 John and, and, and talking about anger, something that's an emotion. Maybe we can add a, another type of emotion in there. And the same message is, let's give all to the glory of God. Let's live in his light. Let's get, live in his presence and know that he is doing incredibly wondrous things for where we are. Let's stand together as we um, leave this place and as we conclude, may the the God of light that gives us uh, that illumination of within our world, illuminate our path as we seek his will in his way. Thank you.